Welcome to our last lab exercise, exercise 23C, Survey of Kingdoms, Part 3, Animal Kingdom. You'll still need your handout. You'll still need to be able to identify organisms, taxons, and characteristics on the handout. Make sure you've got your handout printed out so that you can fill it out while we go through the uh, PowerPoint. As usual, check with your instructor on pre-lab assignments. For my class, there is a pre-lab assignment. You have to answer the five questions on Blackboard. This is the lab exercise, not the pre-lab. There aren't any definitions or figures to look at this week. It's all kingdom, phylum, and selected classes. Do remember the characteristics go with the taxon in bold. Theoretically, we'd be seeing a lot of specimens in lab. If you're taking this as a makeup lab, you will want to look at the um, pictures and possibly Google anything you are not familiar with because we will have specimens in lab. If this is just the online course, the online for spring 2020, well, yeah, we'll be looking at pictures. And do be sure to know any of the items that are on the handout. This week we are working exclusively with Kingdom Animalia. The characteristics are eukaryotic, which means they have a nucleus, heterotrophic, which means they eat other critters, they're multicellular, remember that's many cells, and they tend to be motile, which means they move. There are all sorts of examples. Everything on this handout is an example, from sponges all the way to humans. Sponges are in Kingdom Animalia with the characteristics on the previous slide. Sponges are also in Phylum Periphera. The characteristics of Phylum Periphera would be aquatic and filter feeding. Yeah, sponges would still be in Phylum Periphera. While the sponges do have a class, we're not learning it. Never mind. That's why it says not applicable. Jellyfish are in Kingdom Animalia. There's ditto marks for the characteristics. Jellyfish are in Phylum Nindaria. The C is silent. Who puts silent letters in these things? The characteristics of Phylum Nindaria would be aquatic with tentacles and stinging cells. Jellyfish, sea anemone, corals would all be in Phylum Nindaria. Tapeworms are in Phylum Pladial Hamenthes. Good thing it's not an oral exam. The characteristics are flatworms that do have a definite head end. The platy part, well, everybody always says think of a dinner plate that's flat. Helminth refers to worms. So if you can read through the Latin, it does actually say flatworms. These flatworms do have a definite head end. If you look at the picture on the left, you can see the scoliox with the hooks and suckers that would attach the tapeworm to your intestines where it could suck your blood. The tapeworms do have lots of segments, probably thousands of segments. You can see those in the picture on the right hand side. Each of those segments also has about 50,000 microscopic eggs that could get out and infect the next person. You tapeworms. Liver flukes are also in phylum platial hamenthes. That's why there's ditto marks on the characteristics again, but it's still flatworms with a definite head end. Okay, this liver fluke, if it didn't have the label with the mouth and the testes, I'm not sure I could have told you which was the front end and which is the back end, but they do actually have a definite head end there. The liver flukes can be picked up from eating undercooked uh, shellfish and other fish, and uh, they can get into your liver. As long as you've just got one liver fluke, you're probably okay. If you've got more liver flukes than you do liver, yeah, you'll probably have some problems. The good news is there's some medicine. Ascarius worms are in phylum nematoda. The characteristics of nematodes would be some round worms. While our tapeworms and liver flukes look like somebody would stepped on them and they were flattened, these guys are actually round. The male Ascarius worm does have a hooked shaped tail end, while the female Ascarius worm has a straight end. Oh boy, you too can sex worms. Go home and impress your friends. Let me assure you, you will not impress your friends being able to sex worms, but now you can sex worms. 
Trichnelia spirillus worms are some more worms in phylum Nematoda, so there's still some round worms, so we've got some ditto marks. These round worms are going to spiral up, hence the name. They're also found in pork. Pigs will eat just about anything, including some garbage with some gross <clears throat> fecal matter in it. That might be contaminated with some of these Trichnelia spirillus worms. These worms, instead of staying in the intestines, will go into the meat and the uh, muscle tissue, like the bacon tissue and the pork chop tissue. If you don't cook the pork, you too could have some worms and have some problems with it. Strychnelia spirillus worms, these are the reasons they tell you to cook the pork. Wait, wait a minute. If I cook the pork, don't I? Am, am I just eating cooked worms? Well, yeah but it's better than uncooked worms. Ew! Yeah, there's probably a reason many of the um, religious religions do not like to eat pork for one reason or another. It does have some petty legitimate biology problems. But if you'll cook the pork or freeze it for at least 20 days, that will kill the worm and then you won't have to worry about diseases. Pinworms are in phylum Nematoda with the characteristics of round worms again, so we still got some more ditto marks. Pinworms are common in this country. They are about a half an inch in length when they're fully grown, and they do lay a bunch of eggs. They can be spread from person to person pretty easily. Generally, somebody puts an infected object, like maybe their fingers, in their mouth, and uh, the pinworm, microscopic pinworm eggs get transferred and grow in the intestines. The mommy pinworm, late at night, will come out of the back end of the digestive system, lay some eggs around the anus, and create some itching and scratching. And that goes under the fingernails. If the often child in question puts their thumb back in their mouth, oh yeah, that just um, repeats the process there. If a parent comes in and changes the sheets and the bedding and floofs the sheets, uh, you can still spread the pinworm eggs to mom or dad or any other adult in the family. And yes, if one person in the family has pinworms, probably the entire family has pinworms. Good news is you can get some over-the-counter medicine for that, pin X, and take that lovely tasting stuff. Oh, not that I know anything about what it tastes like or anything, yeah, did I mention it's a very common problem in the United States? Yeah. Earthworms, leeches, and nereus are all in the animal kingdom with its characteristics and ditto marks. They're also in phylum Annelida, which has characteristics of segmented worms. We'll see the three different types because they do have some differences. Ooh, we're going to have to look at some of the different classes of segmented worms. For the class, we'll go there shortly. Earthworms are in Kingdom Animalia and Phylum Annelida and Class Oligochete. The characteristics of Class Oligochete, few bristles, would go in the last rectangle on the row for earthworms. Earthworms are segmented worms. You can see the segments in the pictures here. They also have a few bristles. Well, their bristles are some teeny tiny, almost microscopic things. If you look at the picture on the right very, very closely, you can see what looks like a little pair of hairs. Cilia? Yeah, those would be the bristles. They've only got a few bristles, two bristles per segment or something like that. Oligo does refer to few. Chete, I hope is bristles or hair or something to that effect, because oligochete would have few bristles. Nereus is a marine worm that many students haven't heard of. You might have to study this one even to identify it. It is in Kingdom Animalia and Phylum Annelida. It's in class Polychete. Poly is many, chete is bristles, if you can read through the Latin, it does say many bristles. And even without a microscope, you can see a lot more bristles and hairs on these two worms. 
leeches are in Kingdom Animalia, Phylum Analyta, Class Hiridinae. The characteristics of Class Hiridinae would be they have no bristles and they secrete hiridin, which is an anticoagulant. Turns out when the leeches suck your blood, if they just sucked your blood, your blood would probably clot and then they wouldn't get a meal. Poor little leech! But they do secrete hiridin, which is an anticoagulant, so the blood does not clot, so they keep getting a meal from you. Thanks. Lovely. Officially, the other thing is these uh, leeches have no bristles. I would have put, I would have called the class A chete, A being without, chete being bristles, but nobody asked me. Oh well, class hiridine. From here, we do switch to a different phylum. Phylum mollusca has characteristics of a muscular foot and a shell. Examples include snail, squid, uh, chitin, clam, this, that, the other, all sorts of different critters. It's actually a very big phylum. Snails and slugs are going to be in class gastropoda. Gastro refers to stomach, gastric acid. Poda refers to feet. So it literally says stomach footed. Now, if you're talking about snails and slugs, technically slugs don't have a shell, while snails do have a shell. But they kind of have their mouth connected to their stomach. Yeah, my mouth is connected to my stomach too, but their mouth connected to their stomach tends to be along the ground. That mouth is kind of has a rasping organ that scrapes up food and tosses it into the mouth, and so they're licking the sidewalk. Not a good thing. But their foot does have their mouth on it, and it's kind of connected to their stomach, so if you think about it, it works. Squid and octopi would be in class cephalopoda. Cephalo refers to head. Poda is still foot or footed. These guys are going to be head footed. Most of their muscular foot that puts them in phylum mollusca is kind of their head rather than their stomach. Okay, they've still got a head, they've still got a stomach, but most of what you think of as the muscular foot has a brain in it rather than a stomach in it like the squid and the snails. Chitin is an animal you probably haven't heard of. But it is in class Polylacophoria. The poly part refers to many. Lacophoria? I've never bothered to look it up. I'm hoping it's um, plates or shells. These guys are going to have lots of plates in their muscular foot. In fact, it's a shell with eight plates. Chitin. If you look at the pictures here, on all 16 of the chitons, you do have eight sections. I know, they kind of look like little roly-polies. They are not little roly-polies, but they do have eight plates along their backside. You might have to Google Chitin and look for more pictures if necessary. A clam, oyster, or mussel would all be in class bivalvia. Bi is two. Valves, well, usually I think of heart valves, but these are going to be a shell with two halves. The shell of the clam does come into two pieces. Same thing with the oyster and the mussel. Bivalvia. We're switching phylums again. Uh, centipedes, crayfish, dragonfly, ticks would all be in phylum arthropoda. Arthro refers to joints. Not marijuana, we're not one of those states just yet. But it does refer to uh, joints like maybe your elbow or your knee. Poda would be legs. So these guys do have jointed legs. Most of them will also have an exoskeleton and a few other characteristics that do keep us out of phylum arthropoda. Centipedes are in class Chilopoda. Chilo is a little weird. It does refer to one pair of legs per segment. Poda would be feet, that would be your legs. These guys are going to have one pair of legs per segment. Your classic centipede may not have exactly precisely 50 segments, but a pair of legs per segment, if they had 50 segments, would be about 100. 
centi refers to 100 in the metric system. And so a centipede, I'm not going to guarantee it has 100 legs. Some of them can't count. But it would have a pair of legs per segment and be in class Chilopoda. We aren't, aren't going to talk about millipedes that would be in class Dilopoda. Class Dilopoda has two pairs of legs per segment, so it has a lot more legs. Also, the segments tend to be a little smaller, so the millipedes have more segments and hence more le legs. Maybe not exactly the thousand legs, as the name says, but they do have more legs. Class Dilopoda was not on the handout. You don't need to know that one. Crayfish, lobster, shrimp, etc. are all in class crustacean, which makes them crustaceans. The characteristics would be aquatic and six or more legs. If you look at the little crayfish on the left, you can see a whole bunch of legs there. Plus he's got some claws, plus he's got some swimmerettes underneath. He's got a lot of legs. He's got more than six legs. And he's aquatic. And he's good eating. Dragonflies, fleas, butterflies, cockroaches, bees, etc. would all be in class Insecta. These guys are going to have six legs. Most of them have the parts to make wings. Some of them know how to use them. Some of them don't. Yeah, don't look too closely to cockroach. They do actually have wings. They don't really know what to do with them. Falling with style. But uh, all of these guys would have the parts to make wings. Although we'll concentrate on the six legs. Ticks, spiders, and scorpions are not insects. They're in class Arachnida with the characteristics of eight legs. If you look closely at the ticks in the picture, they do all have eight legs, not six, eight for the, usually we talk about spiders being in class Arachnida, but the handout does have ticks. You should learn the ticks. Our next phylum is phylum Econodermata. That means spiny skin. The econo part refers to spiny, and dermata is like dermis or epidermis and skin. Starfish, sea stars, sand dollars, etc. would all have some spiny skin. It may not be quite as stabby as it sounds like. Some of these species do actually have some needle sharp spines, but uh, sand dollars, sea stars, they're probably more just a rough skin rather than owie, owie, owie spines. There are various classes in Phylum Econodermata. For more details, take a science major course. They get into more classification than we do. Our last phylum is Phylum Chordata. Sometimes people talk about these being vertebrate animals because we do have vertebrae, but officially the characteristics are right small, a notochord, dorsal hollow nerve tube, pharyngeal gill slits, and a post-anal tail. The notochord does refer to the vertebrae, or at least some structures before you get before you're born that become the vertebrae. The dorsal hollow nerve cord, call it the spinal cord and go on with life. Pharyngeal gill slits are the things we share with the uh, fish embryos 24 days into, oh, sorry, wrong movie. But uh, we don't have gills anymore. We did as embryos, but we do start with them, so we had them at some point. Same thing with the post-anal tail. If you look behind you, you do not actually have a tail sticking out like cats and dogs. But we do have some coccyx vertebrae that are the remains of a tail that you did have as an embryo probably between four to six weeks along. We lost that postanal tail just like we lost a lot of these other characteristics or it became something else. Phylum chordata does include all the rest of the things on the handout. Lamprey, eels, sharks, this, that, the other, all the way to humans. Lamprey eels are in class Agnatha. That has characteristics of jawless fish. The A part is without. The natha refers to the jaws. So it does actually say jawless. Well, it doesn't quite say fish, but it does say jawless on the fish. These lamprey eels are related to the hagfish that sometimes spawn off the coast of Norway. Oh, sorry, Sea of Life video again. 
these lamprey eels, you can see on the picture on the left, they do have some sort of teeth, although they don't have a mandible or maxilla, lower or upper jaw. Ew, the teeth just kind of stick into the gums? Yeah, kind of. And I still say with that yellow color, they probably need to brush a little better. Ew. A dogfish shark would be in class chondrichthys. Chondry refers to cartilage. Ichthys refers to fish. These guys don't actually have bones like we do. They do have some sort of skeleton, but it is made out of cartilage rather than calcium for strong bones. They do, however, have jaws that bite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The uh, dogfish shark would be in class chondrichthys with cartilaginous fish. Perch, trout, flounder, catfish, and other assorted bony fish would be in class osteoichthys. The osti part does refer to bone, like osteoporosis would be holes in the bones, and ichthys is still fish, so osteoichthys does mean bony fish. In the lab, we do have a really cute um, skeleton left over from a fish. It does actually have skeleton, much like our human skeleton. A salamander is not a lizard. Salamander is in class amphibia. That means they reproduce in water and live on the land. The amphi part refers to two, like amphidextrous, you can use both hands. The ibia, pff, I don't know, life, I guess. It is, going to, it is going to have two lives. One life is going to live on land, and then it will go back to the water to reproduce. And generally, the little babies are born in the water and will mature in the water. Frogs, toads, and salamanders would all be in class amphibia. Snakes and turtles are in class reptilia. Reptiles would reproduce and live on the land. Okay, yeah, I know some of the sea turtles will reproduce on the land and then they'll go go to the water. But as a group, they will reproduce on the land and live on the land. Although I admit it is usually near water. In lab, we've got a cool two-headed snake. We do not have a two-headed snake. We have two snake heads that have been sliced off the um, ends there and put together in some plastic. It is not a two-headed snake. But you're not in lab, so you can't see it. Never mind. Birds are in class aves because they have feathers and fly. The handout talks about the little sparrow, but eagles and all sorts of other birds would have feathers and fly. Miss, but, but what about the penguins? Penguins still have feathers. Okay, maybe they don't exactly know how to fly. Although a lot of times they'll talk about them flying more underwater. They're very aerodynamic underwater. Maybe they don't fly through the air so much as fly through the water. Okay, fine, close enough. Concentrate on the feathers then. Class mammalia has hair and <clears throat> mammary glands, like the name says. It does include things from a duck-billed platypus, to kangaroos, to humans, to cows, cats, dogs, etc. Check with your instructors. Sometimes people get into more details and get into different orders, but not for lab. For any organism on the handout, we could ask you to identify the organism. We could ask you what kingdom it's in. It's all in Kingdom Animalia today. We can ask what phylum is it in. We could ask what class is it in. We could ask what are the characteristics of the kingdom, or the phylum, or the class that this animal is in. We could tell you that you found a new species that has two lives. Which class would you put it in? Or we could tell you you found a new species with spiny skin. Which phylum would you put it in? We can ask all sorts of questions. Be sure to know all of the information on the handout. When you are through with Biology 1408 and 1409 labs, the lab book is yours. Keep it, sell it, give it to somebody, throw it away, whatever. But if you were just going to throw it away, I do take donated books for future students to borrow. Usually it's students who uh, have some good financial need, or maybe they took 1408 on a different campus and had to buy another book. 
No extra credit for donating a lab book. It's just out of the goodness of your heart. But if you were just going to throw it away, we take those. If you could give it to your instructor at some point or leave it in SSCI 1212, that would be great. But it is yours. If you want to have another plan for it, that is not a problem.